All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to the Coach's Corner. Uh, I'm producing tonight, so that's why we lost our background for a moment. Uh, but uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope you're going to enjoy this show. This is going to be kind of an interesting one, and we'd love to hear from everybody. But uh, the, the title of this one is, uh, What the F Does That Mean? And we're going to cover a bunch of different terms used in SCA fighting and some of the terms that we use on this on our podcast. Uh, describing all the things like footwork and all kinds of different things. So if you ever wondered what does a specific term mean, uh, feel free to, to shout it out into the comments. Um, Bronis is going to be watching the comments, and I will too, and we're going to try to try to get everybody uh, up to speed on what, what terms and words mean uh, that don't seem necessarily clear or, or intuitive. Um, so, now yeah, welcome to the show. Bronis, great, great to see you again, my friend. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. Yeah. Uh, it's been a week, I tell you. Um, once again, it's it's uh, the, the week is hard to struggle through the week, and thank God to it, Friday nights have been coming. So, <laughs> that it is. At least we get um, the talk stick. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's been it, tricky uh, for me, at least, trying to think of all the terms that I've been hearing for okay. over thirty some years that are just embedded in my brain, and I know what they mean. And and now it's like, okay, sit down and think about all of them. And we, I just sort of did a brain dump on a bunch of the terms that um, I remember struggling with uh, back in the day and, and all throughout it. And then finding out that uh, terms mean different things in different regions uh, to people. So the first thing I'll say as a caveat, this is not a definitive, there is one definition to a term or a word that's used. So um, yeah, this is going to be kind of a fun thing to hear kind of different opinions too. So if you hear a term and we have a slightly different definition, just give us a shout. I'd love to hear what, uh, what you know, different people in different areas, different kingdoms uh, think of that term. Or even if you're not in the SCA, if you're in a, a different fighting group or different uh, martial culture, I'd love to hear what, what you guys use for these terms or um, things like that. So where should we get started? I know. Uh, well, I think Bess is already hammering us. Bess is, um, is on it. This must be like a two martini evening for her. So. I know. I Great. guess you know, <laughs> uh, which is awesome. Uh, thanks, Bess, for uh, for throwing some out to start with. Let's talk about uh, a little bit. You know, here's a big one: the scorpion mm -hmm. uh, shot, right? Uh, yep. And uh, we'll go through a bunch of the other comments that were posted up, but uh, that one's always a good one. My. You know, and I'm going to throw it from when I explain it. And, it, you know, uh, the, the scorpion shot is essentially a, a long wrap, but it comes almost straight over like a scorpion tail and strikes on a, right. you stop and that sword whips in. It's not mm -hmm. a pulling shot. It's, it's a whip and you, you stop at a point, your arm still, you can, arm still can be bent. And that sword comes right down straight and, and hits. I've seen people throw rats. Uh, we have a, our scorpion shots where they'll actually hit somebody in the butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, in uh, fact, and yeah, Alanon got me with that on a, at a Gulf Wars. I, I was, you know, charging in and he just, with his big orangutan arm, just slung that sword right over over the top and <laughs> strike me right down the back. It was gorgeous. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, and I've seen it thrown as a as a thrust without having the blade go behind the body, but very rarely. Um, in fact, Finn took me out in the finals of attorney uh, in in uh, uh, Care Antarth years ago with that one. Um, oh, so is that like the hand comes above yeah, and yeah, you, you throw it up top? Right. And it, like it was going to turn over, but he was far enough away that I knew he wasn't going to get behind me. But he threw it down and this thrust came right down to basically like the bridge of my nose. Um, ah. it, was, it was sublime. He did it. It was fantastic. But yeah, same arc, but it, and it looked the same, but. You know, with the distance, it didn't appear to be the threat, but no, it was good. Um, All right. Well, she threw another one out, and she's going to have to explain this one because I have no damn clue what this is. Oh, Rick Rack from, okay. That's a term that, that's new to me as well. I, I know. Um, uh, maybe there she's maybe it's somebody there, listening uh, from Trimeris or, or who has traveled to Trimeris uh, <laughs> or, or come across this term. Please, I would love to know what this one is. Um, I know. Well, Bess, Bess is going to have to post it up because we're uh, we're confused yeah. on that one. All right, one. Bess, here's your homework. Put down the exactly. mark and go call somebody from Trimeris. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then she's she's already starting to, to to throw some of the ones that were brought up, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and bring it up because let's let's talk yeah. with, let's talk with the first one, and it's that's just the the good old fashioned. Well, let's talk about the flat snap. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, and it's kind of funny because the, the, the person that posted is like, so what's the difference between a flat snap and a snap or a wobbly snap or, and, uh, you know, so I was like, I, I've never heard of a wobbly snap, although someone actually uh, answered that, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there's a number of things that people talk about snaps, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and there's actually the, I, I think the flat snap, somebody in the forums, um, I believe, and I'd have to go in and check, uh, in our comments actually tells about that, fl the flat snap. And that is that, that rotational, this, that sword, kind of like my, my feel was it's like serving the pizza. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people talk about like, hey, you were throwing a flat snap. I actually don't really throw a flat snap. I'll flatten it out at the end. But that angle is, you know, that angle is coming pretty straight until I change the angle at the end. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. really consider that a flat snap. Sure. Well, it looks like uh, the response for the Rick Rack is the for the forehand backhand combo, which makes sense. Oh, that, bang, that's bang. all over the place. Bang, yep. Bang, yep. Right. OK, that is, you know what? And and. That's a good call because I actually do remember that. That was a long time ago. I've heard that. Long, yep, long time ago. Well, thanks. Uh, now thanks another for one. Answering your own question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's why we keep Bess on staff. She's, she's eminently useful that way. One of the big ones, and this is uh, God, it goes back for years. The difference between a wrap, a J stroke, and a thumb leader. Like these are all terms that that are convey using the back edge of the blade to hit somebody behind basically from behind them instead of using the leading edge to drive like you would a snap or an offside shot um and there's maybe we can get into some of the the, the minutiae of what differentiates a wrap from a j-stroke from a thumb leader if you want yeah to I, I think that's uh you know and and that's one's going to be kind of hard to tell you the truth I, I i mean i've been around for i i've seen lots of people uh define this different and tell you the truth if uh you know uh, it, it, there were there's a couple of people that talked. I actually, I think it was Paul that talked about a thumb leader, um, you know, compared to uh, a wrap. Um, mm -hmm. And it was based on position of the arm. In fact, let me just read uh, a little bit. Let me, uh, let me post it. And then we're going to read. I'll, I'll, I'll post it up on the screen here. So this is, although it's probably not going to show much. Yeah. So the thumb leader is a blow designed to hit with the back edge of the applied power, right? While mm -hmm. applying power. So that that essentially the back edge of the sword and you're throwing and, and you're creating that power. Mm -hmm. um, but it leaves your arm really far extended because you're like all the way over. Mm -hmm. um, and then he mentions that uh, if it hits with the arm bent, it lacks the power in that type of throw with a wrap. Where... Uh, I think, uh, you know, when we get into a thumb leader, the idea is, is you actually can throw it in here with your arm bent and you create a whipping action. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So you create that little whip and a J hook is essentially a drop in a whip mm -hmm. so that, that you come down and just like a J. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times I'll talk to people, uh, you know, and, and that J hook, it's kind of funny how we, def we define some naming based on what it does. I talk a little bit, and this is probably not something that's talked about a lot, but I talk about the essentially throwing the L with the sword to get it inside line. Mm -hmm. So what the idea is this sword comes across and out instead of an angle out. So here you have this angle coming this way. In the, in the L shot, your, your elbow comes in and the sword comes in. So you got, it comes across and then straight up. Mm -hmm. So you have an angle. That essentially takes, if you have a shield there and I'm coming at the angle, that angle gets picked up by the shield. Where right. when my elbow drops in the body here, so so if I'm in here and my elbow drops, now I'm inside the line of their shield. Now I can finish mm -hmm. inside that line of the shield. But if, right. I, if I just extend straight out, I'm going to catch the outside of the shield because I haven't gotten into it yet. So that's mm -hmm. what I essentially call the L, but um, the J is, is essentially that, that hooking J. Motion with the back well, and that brings up another term that I didn't that I totally forgot about, which is the drop shot, which is to actually bring your hand across the, that center line of the shield and then drop the hand down to flip the sword straight into the body, uh, usually following the parallel line of that yeah of, of the shield. Mm -hmm. 
So should have thought of that one, but blanked out on it. That's um, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and and again, I think you know Fox mentions here um, that uh, you know the thumb leader can put some rough strain on the inside of the elbow because, and that's, that's what I found because uh, yeah. when if the what the text that you read there was was Duke Paul talking about it's dangerous to the user if it hits with the arm extended. That's exactly what I found. So over time, it felt better to me to use what I guess would be called the thumb leader or the J stroke. And I, but I always keep my elbow bent. Yeah, and yeah. so that the forearm could, could roll really relaxed and it would not strain the elbow or the, uh, or the shoulder. Um, all right. Here's a, here's a, here's a good one because uh, he all does right. it all the time. And I, I kind of like the shoulder jerk. Okay. I'm guessing this is probably one of his favorite shots. So he'll throw, he'll get that sword. He'll get the sword behind your head. Mm -hmm. But then instead of a wrap, you know, instead of this, he gets mm -hmm. it back there and he pulls. Yes. Yeah, I've seen that right? one too. And he can yep. add a little bit of hand on that. Bang, right? You get a little bit mm -hmm. of turning hand and you're pulling that sword back. Uh, mm -hmm. Very hard to execute with a ton of power unless your timing is really good uh, yep. in, in uh, Jack. You Blunt's know, it was kind of funny because uh, I don't know if you remember Trev, one of my housemates years ago. And he had, he tried to do a wrap shot and it really wasn't. He, because he was a big, strong guy, powerful in the shoulders. And he did exactly that shoulder jerk. He'd start with his sword. He'd put it behind your head, turn the blade down and just pull. <laughs> because he had, it was so powerful. It would, I mean, it would almost loosen your teeth. Yeah. But it, it was, there was no real glide to it. Um, you know, for me, a wrap shot needs a, a pretty nice glide curve to really get that power because I'm not powerful in the shoulders. So I would use more of a snap with it. Yes. Um, I, I throw the whip more than the hammer. Yeah, the whip. Exactly. And, and there was no whip. That. For him, it was all mechanical leverage. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about that though. You hear that all the time, the whip and the hammer, right? Mm -hmm. So the hammer, essentially you think of it as a real hammer. It, it's it, the idea is momentum is carrying through an object. Mm -hmm. So with the hammer, and there's some, uh, the, the, the book I had mentioned, uh, Fight Like a Physicist a little while, he explains the difference essentially between uh, the whip and the hammer. And uh, one is essentially momentum, and then the other is force. Uh, and, and force can literally be surface force or something like that. Right. So momentum carries through. And it doesn't matter if you have armor or padding or anything else, momentum will still move you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the idea where... The whip is is not going to tend to move people, but it creates a very pointed uh, piece of, of, of power on the surface or even, even deeper in, but not with as much momentum. Right. Um, to give you a feel on that, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, the, the whip is very much like uh, a gunshot, uh, you know, where to, if you hit somebody with a, you know, throw a cannonball at them. It's going to go, it's going to push them back because it has a tremendous amount of momentum. Mm -hmm. If I whip a tennis ball at somebody, you could literally bounce off of them. You're not, you don't move. Mm -hmm. All right. Some of that has to deal with how much weight, obviously there's lots of calculations on that, but, mm -hmm. um, but really that idea. And so you take a whip, the whip is, I throw this little hook wrap. That's kind of the whip. Mm -hmm. I throw that pulling shoulder. That's momentum. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, right? exactly. So, yeah. um, um, let's cool. see, rising snap. Mm -hmm. So, so are we talking, so we're not talking rap here in my mind. Mm -hmm. What do you think a rising snap they're referring to here? Well, going back to when, when I was taught this, it was you, you, you start your snap and you start to lower your shoulder to try to telegraph that you're, you're aiming for the leg, getting somebody to lower their defense down. And then you bring that shoulder straight forward and you deliver the shot to the head because they just lowered their guard to cover their leg. That's what was, to me, always was the, the rising snap part. Um, yeah, I would love to have uh, Uther here to explain because he does one too. And that's what my idea is. I drop my shoulder, but then the snap is actually rising on an angle. Yeah. Up. And I think uh, you could do it with any other signal or telegraph that convinces your opponent that you're going low. It doesn't need to be dropping no. the shoulder. No, um, it could be your whole body drops a little bit. Yep. You know, um, Uther throws it in. And I, I don't know if I would call his a rising snap, but man, it, it, they should call it something because I love the shot. <laughs> I was able to perform it at one fight practice after 20 years of trying to get it to work correctly. And okay. 
you'll drop that sword. The sword's down, hidden by your shield. Then it rises up along and smashes your head. Oh, okay. And let me tell you, it is an incredible shot. He throws a. I've seen a couple of people. I saw something exactly like that in a in a front yard with a somebody with an aluminum baseball bat, and they hit somebody <laughs> right in the head from from hanging down by their body. Yeah, and, uh, it was lights out. Yeah, and it's uh, it, the power in it is amazing. Um, it there's a lot of almost relaxation you have to put in your body to make that that shot work. But I wouldn't, I, I can't, I hesitate to call that the rising snap. I, I believe he right. probably has a better name for it. The rising no, snap. I, I did see one, uh, and this was several years ago. It was uh, actually Duke Khan was using this at a, a tournament. I watched him where he'd walk up and, you know, at the beginning of fight, they'd, they'd establish like just outside of range. And of course, anybody was scared of him because he was really good. And he, they'd walk up and he'd, he'd have his, you could tell you could feel like a little bit of tension in his body and then he just did this exhale and relaxed and yeah they saw that the shield drop a little bit and it, this is where I, I noticed they were his opponents would mirror him when they when he would relax oh, yeah. he'd tip his helm a little bit like he was just chilling and they do the same and then he just fire the shot it was not a rising snap but it was the same telegraphing of okay now you can relax for a second but they didn't realize they were in range and they were done. Like I saw him walk through half a dozen people like that. Yep. And um, and that can be done through, you know, even the flat snap. I mean, even that, mm -hmm. that push that line and then throw it out. The idea is, is that can right. be a really smooth yep. scenario, right? Um, you know, and it's pretty funny because I was, as I was watching this, uh, one of my housemates came up and he wouldn't even squared, although he had some quick hands and he's like, oh, I got it. I just drew Khan in the, in my, in, my next round what am i going to do and i said just wait for him to breathe out and just fire a fast shot into the side of his head and it worked <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome you know and he came back he was thrilled but you know it was just kind of funny but when somebody you see somebody using the same method over and over and over again watch yeah. it, watch what they're doing and figure out all right how am i not going to fall into this trap and, and how can i turn this around uh to do it anyway yeah we can we got a lot of terms to cover, so we can go on. But that was, I still remember that was a lot of fun. Um, okay. Uh, let's see what we've got. We got the thumb leader. Uh, got that one. Um, I put this one on my list, and I'd heard this term called short sticking, which is yeah. when, when you don't swing the sword or you, you basically, and I think this happens a lot more in melee when you get really close in and locked, and you basically just turn and jam your sword, like you're pushing your sword right above the it's still on the blade but it's above the hilt just right into somebody it's almost like a punch um it impacts a lot it has a lot more momentum like you were talking not much snap but you can really get uh that power pop from from that short stick um some some fighters i notice use it more than others others never use it at all or don't even maybe realize that they can do that with their sword um but yeah, it's something that I noticed, and I've heard the term once in a while. Um, all right, so we got. Well, yeah, I mean, sure, I, for sure. I, I, you, sometimes you get short sticked by accident, right? Right. Yeah. And absolutely. those are those are some of the worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it can, especially when there's some meat behind that shoulder that's yeah. that's throwing it. I mean, it it can. Uh, yeah, it can it can ring your bell. Um, yeah, so we've kind of grouped these out. I wanted to let's maybe cover some of the the we did some of the shots, sword shots and whatnot. One I wanted to mention, and I totally forgot about this one. It's not a sword shot, but it's a polearm shot. And I think everybody's probably heard this one, the circle jerk. Yeah. So any polearm one. fighter that fights sword and shield fighters or two sword fighters has got to know this one. And uh even when you know it's coming, it can still take you down. Um, and that is when you take the tip and you, you either start to thrust in or, or you have, you engage one line and you swing around as somebody tries to cover that line and you swing around and you hit them on the other side and it can go left or right. It can start anywhere on the circle really to try to bait somebody into moving their, their guard, uh, to cover that, the, the open side, but, um, curse it up. The term always gets a chuckle, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I know Duke Tom up here in North Shield. That's oh, yeah. a mainstay shot for him. And and he also everybody does knows he does it. It's not like it's a secret. And he no. still lands it. It's like an 
shot for him. Um, I, I like his helicopter, man. He, he'd sit on your yeah. arm so you can't do nothing. And it's mm-hmm. just like, bang, bang, you know? Yep. Exactly. Uh, he does a like really interesting the pole arm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so uh, along with that, though, let's let's cover another shot that people hear. Moulinet. The Moulinet. Yep. All you right. Know, let's, you, you run with that one. So I used to do that a lot. It's a, to me, I use the Moulinet to essentially delay or break the time of a shot. So mm-hmm. if you throw a shot, people are waiting. You could start that motion and the sword comes back a little bit and it comes in. So essentially you're here, you're, that hand kind of rotates and then it sort of circles over your head. Yeah, it creates a bigger circle up front. Mm-hmm. So, so you have that hand. Right. Right. And you can, and it can go both directions. Yep. And sometimes that, that little bit, you get that little kind of that same, because, you know, you're, you're, you're essentially start, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got that loop. It's like a double loop, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, on that point, uh, on the, just because it it's it, kind of the same thing, but much bigger uh, and, and a little, uh, probably a little risque for a shot name, but it's uh, uh, the Cowboy Stripper is uh, another one that we talk about on uh, <laughs> uh, on uh, our uh, uh, Great Fighters of YouTube. Because okay. you get these guys, they take their whole sword and they swing it around. Right. And it, it, it's like, and you're amazed. You're like, how they hit somebody with that? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. they do. But it's it's not just the tip circling. It is like, bang! It is like, oh, so sure. we always laugh every time we see a cowboy strip. Nice. <laughs> well, I would imagine it deliver a lot of power. Because you, the, the, the flatter that circle is, the more you can bring that momentum around. Oh, and when yeah. it comes, it lands like a, like a freight train. Um, but yeah, and, and it also occurs to me, the Moulinet can actually be vertical, not just horizontal. So it's, it's so, that kind yeah. of that sweeping spiral arc. So, so that Moulinet that I throw to the outside, cause I wanted to, there's not a, it wasn't done a lot. And when I started, I, in fact, a Moulinet to the leg was rarely done. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a lot of slashes to the legs or drop and pull that elbow back through the legs. Mm-hmm. Um, a Moline ends up out. So I wanted to do the Moline out. And we, you know, it's all about the front end timing because you're 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 out in front of that sword. This is a very hard position that you got the your arms are like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you have to when I first started, I'd wait for them, I'd give them my head the head to throw at, and then I'd mm-hmm. slip and hit them in the leg with that shot. And mm-hmm. the key on that shot is that you're the same hip as your arm throwing has to push forward, mm-hmm. right? Because then you're pushing past the shield. You're not drawing back. You're actually pushing in. So that's that's the lower mon- Moulinet. And there's a mm-hmm. Moulinet to, to arms, right? Right. Same mm-hmm. shot. Roll. Now you're more on almost like a 45 degree, a little higher. And you start down here, and then you, you flack. And your hand breaks out, so your sword ends up breaking across. So you could mm-hmm. literally be outside their their sword breaking behind it. Right. I think I think a, a shot with that rolling action is pretty much descriptive of what a moulinet is. Yep. Um, no matter what angle you're you're doing it at. Um, I know Bess has jumped in with a number of melee terms. I think what we'll do is is uh, we'll cover the single combat stuff and then we'll we'll group up melee yeah. terms yeah and then we'll put all the melee little, stuff because there's a bunch down, of good down melee the road stuff. here yeah um so with the sword shots related to that is guard positions and i know uh oh, a frame is one of, of them, them. yep yeah there's there's a number of them a frame has become very popular in the last several decades um and i think everybody kind of understands that that you know you're looking at the a so you have either one sword or the other and the other if you're two sword or you have a yeah. shield and, and your sword are providing the the two sides of the a um that's that's my understanding of why they call yeah, it and an sometimes they're like yeah, that shield is giving you this angle and, right. and the sword gives you that angle um and and you know lot there's a lot of modifications that they, 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 the 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 mm-hmm. shield can be a little farther in uh, but essentially it's what you start in that's kind of that a frame right um, right. You know, another no. guard, the, the roofing guard, right? So talking about housing, house terms. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
So uh, yeah, roofing guard, right? Where this arm's hanging here, but the sword is hanging here. So that's, now that's uh, what what I had always heard called the hanging guard or the, or the hanging guard. guard. Yep. Um, yep. Now I I'd never heard the term house guard uh, or roof guard. Did you call it? Yeah, it's a, I, I, it really, it's a position where your sword ends up in a roofing position. So okay. I don't like him here. So I'll say you're roofing, you know, and that means that you're hanging this arm out. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah. And the St. George's guard, there's a, a really great, uh, I think it's a woodblock print of, you know, St. George on the horse and he's got his yep. sword up over his head with the tip down in front. Now, whether or not you keep the tip back so you could actually strike with it or the point is forward, either way, it's... Uh, considered a hanging guard because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're St. George's, it's up, the hand is up over your head. Now, I remember prior to the A-frame becoming more popular, another term they call was the gunslinger. Yeah. Where the that's... sword sat on the shoulder, the blade was pointed backwards and the pommel was pointed forward. And from there you would throw in. And I guess back in the, the dark horde days uh, and even in the mid realm when two sword was very popular, it was a classic two sword gunslinger where they just had both swords yep. set up on the shoulder and they would fire from from there. There was no defense, no uh, inherent defense like an A-frame would have. Um, and then I remember Osis used his two swords like that A-frame. So he'd bring them out into that A-frame position and fight from there. So so you also have, so you got the gunslinger, you got mm -hmm. Old Castle. Right, right. Old Castle, right? Right. That's kind of that sword down your back. That, yeah, you know, that was big in Antir. Was that? I think that was really big in Antir, wasn't it? Dropping that, having that sword I, down behind the back. And for the longest time, I don't know if it still so is. So I'm but. sure it was. It's actually, it, you know, obviously it's one of the first early guards, uh, mm -hmm. probably, you know, from the West. And, you know, of course, Antir drove off of that. But, sure. um, uh, and you still actually see some people doing, even in the Med Realm, you still see some people doing this. Uh, Karyadoc. Mm -hmm still teaches it you know, when he's out and, and shows how it's done. Okay. Um, so, so it's definitely an older style and, you know, just mm -hmm. like any of these, all of these have their bonuses, you know, their, their benefits and their deficits and, sure. um, you know, and, and it's really, you know, how you teach and, and also your body type and how you move. So, yep. Flat no, guard. I, don't know. I remember when I was down in Anstior, they had this, this guard, which had kind of the, that shield up and they had the hilt sort of in front of the face. I never yeah. know if they had a name for that guard. I don't know if, if there was a term for it or not. Maybe if somebody. Yeah, I would have loved that. that. You know, that's, that's a great question um, mm -hmm. because they do that a lot. You know um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's like a real term to that. You know, I, we just call it basket blocking or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, Tarquin does that here quite a bit. Um, and I've called it, I've heard it called like a boxing type stance, because if you took the shield and the sword away, you, you have your fists up in front of your, in front of you, like a boxer would have, but they didn't use those terms down there. So no, no. That I've heard, but, um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, another, another one is, and this is the one I see in anterior all the time. And that's that flat guard. I used to call it the, uh, uh, and in fact, if anybody, uh, goes and sees a new boxing movie out, um, Creed three, uh, he, uh, his opponent uses it, uh, in there. I was like, it's the old George Foreman clamshell style where that essentially you're almost straight across, you know, you're in here like this, okay. but their sword rides right across the top, you know, and they're looking in between here and they can, that sword mm -hmm. can tilt and pick stuff up. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then you mentioned in here, high guard. Yeah. Or did we so, cover that? That's one? a good question. You know, what is high guard is, you know, I've seen some people they'll fight with that sword way up here. Yeah. You know, is that high guard? I don't, you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So uh, I'm trying to think if there are any other guard positions that we, uh, best ask. So there's, uh, the, the, there's the X fight guard, right? right? There's the What's X that? guard. The X guard. Oh, yeah. The X guard. Yep. Yep. That's true. Right. And that one, and, I, I think, and, and it's funny because now we see that in MMA as well, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I I don't see it around a, a lot because of how vulnerable it is if somebody fires into that top quadrant because it can lock up two weapons. But yes. uh, it it has it like you said it has its uses. Um, Bess asked uh, if a spear fighter fights right or left handed, is their right hand on the butt of the spear? So what would a right right handed guard versus a left-handed guard position. I guess it's whether your lead hand or, you know, everybody's tends to have a one hand that's a little stronger than the other. 
So for I'm a right-hander and I would usually fight spear with my right hand back. Uh, and I, I wish I would have gone back and forth and fought left hand back. Cause I yeah. never got really, I never got really comfortable fighting with left hand back um, with pole arm or, or with spear, but I found lots of ways to, to fire. Like I was, like I did have left hand back. Um, there are ways to adopt it, but, um, but yeah. So I'm um, trying to think of other guard positions. I know with, uh, with the pole arm, one of the ones that I liked was, I call this a Chinese guard where you put the blade down and you hold, you hold the, the, the pole arm vertically with the butt end up over your head. Um, it was really very good for defense or if you got legged, uh, it didn't put you far away from being able to strike, especially low line stuff. Um, I found it really helpful. Uh, well, I, if we're going to talk about that, sure. how about talking about what's a, what's a punch block? Oh yeah. A punch block. Um, I'd always Does seen that as you actually, instead of just putting an obstacle between the, the weapon and yourself, you're actually counter punching into, into that weapon that's coming, whether it's your sword or your shield, you're, you're actually punching forward and, and, and popping it a little bit higher energy, but it also, if somebody's hitting with power or they, or they have their body behind it, you have a better chance of, of stopping it or pausing them than just merely absorbing the power of their blow in, into your, into your shield or into your sword. So here's, here's one that's kind of interesting, you know, cause they also call it the tent or hanging block, right? That's that sword mm -hmm. hanging block. Mm -hmm. um or what we are even referring to as and and as a a, a a roof block or whatever and that sword could hang anywhere by the way it doesn't have to hang right back over here or you know mm -hmm. you can hang it out in front of you even you know and then mm -hmm. roll out um I, but it's uh it's interesting because cj from calentier uh talked a little bit um and i think he was talking tip down uh not horror uh, so he's talking um Great sword, tip down. Uh, it looks like he's talking to great sword, essentially doing that same kind of thing. But they also, it, it's interesting. Have you ever heard of the, the iron chicken guard? I've heard the term, but I, I've not known what that is. I know, same here. I'm like, I'll have to go and ask and see if we can. That was not it, big in, the, in our region, in the mid realm or in, or in North Shield is, is that. But I will say this, when I, when I, started uh studying aikido we were doing uh some of the uh the boken work and what they call that is when you bring the blade behind your head they call this a yes. watershed block so yes. as you sweep behind and to cover the back of your head which i've done many times in a melee um is dropping that sword back to catch the wrap that's coming or you know a blow from somebody from your side you swing it around to catch to protect the back of your head and then you can deliver a shot or bring it back into your guard position but the SCA, I had never heard anybody use the term watershed block. But there's a, yeah, yet another term from another martial realm floating in there. No, and, that, and that's good. I mean, you know, it, it, this is that space where the idea is to throw stuff out there to give the feel of the, you know, what it actually means. Now, and, and again, like you said, this regionally, these could change. Even practice to practice, it could change depending on who's teaching it, right? Because yeah. we don't have a book. Well, we have more books now, but we didn't have a book published way back when, and right. uh, and, and we're doing we're doing adding and more and more stuff all the time. So um, it, it's interesting, you know, because like we'll, we'll talk a little bit about catch work and stuff like that, and you know, catch work is a lot of boxing terminology that's starting to come into our game as well, mm -hmm. uh, including footwork tech, you know, tons of footwork stuff, the drop step, all of these things are coming mm -hmm. in, right? We could right. keep calling them out and there'll be more coming in as they make sense to add to our sport and, and help trainers help people understand what to do. It's a lot easier to essentially, you know, for, and in the beginning, we didn't have, you know, not a lot of sports use swords. We didn't have a lot of books that called that kind of stuff out. So we had to make up our own terms. Mm -hmm. But when we get into footwork, we have lots more like a lot of our our ladder drill terms are terms right out of the, you know, right out of other people's ladder drills. Although I will tell you that those change as well across a lot of different sports, ladder drills, you know, some boxing terminology compared to soccer terminology is somewhat different. Yeah. 
and language is a living thing it evolves so it will always it'll always change and adapt um okay so i got it i gotta get this one from bess flying chicken for two stick i got nothing on a flying chicken um, so i'm wondering and she can answer this one is the flying chicken for two stick kind of a double wrap in other words a jump double wrap okay yeah. it's kind of like the valharix flying burrito which is basically a scorpion from from a jump okay i'll buy that could be um so i'm not well, I'm sure where all these chicken terms come from but uh you know <laughs> <laughs> let's see uh she's got a bunch of stuff we're gonna go back to the melee stuff after um so uh, here's another one I, I I have heard of, and maybe you can explain it. A dump block. A dump block. That one's new to me. Uh, so I think what a dump block, and and some of that there's a couple you could you know, you could essentially st start in a higher position for your block, and as that block's made, you you take it and just that tip falls like you're dumping it out, mm -hmm. and then you can rotate into a strike. Okay. Right. So instead sure. of having it down, it actually starts in, in this position. You take your shot, you take all the power out of it, and then you use that rolling momentum to create something else. Okay. Yeah, that seems viable. So, all right. So so Best describes, uh, it, the, about I guess, about the flying chicken for two stick. He said, she said, it's a stance. Osis did it, starting off with arms raised and spread wide. Ah, uh, Osis is old one. This is the... Right. The... the and and actually it's interesting because he used triangle steps in yes. in using this so his block was a triangle step out of position with a counter throw right so and for he, those who can't see he he had he didn't have one foot forward he fought even footed like yeah horse riding yeah. stance or not yeah or kind of horse riding stance right in front of you right right um and he used a lot by the way yeah and he he'd use lateral movement so if you moved forward He'd move to the side, to yep. one side or the other, and or the other. you on on that oblique opening. It was a he, weird, very. I never seen anybody else do it. Yeah, do that. His timing um, was very good. You had to have yeah. any, and and because he would pull this back, he would create all of this momentum on this side. Yep. Right. Um, mm -hmm. He used to call it gating, like a a gate swinging open. Mm hmm. It was funny because he, I mean, he and I were friends and and I'd sit down and I'd say, all right, explain to me how you do what you do. And it was funny because he, he was, I mean, top level performer, but he had a hard time articulating, describing the, all the nuances of what he had put together that was, that was effective. And, you know, he was able to do it, but it wasn't like he could just rattle off and say, all right, here's what I do. Here's how I do it. You know, to him, it was, I just hit somebody. You know, <laughs> not quite that simplistic, but um, for an analyst mind like mine, I was like, okay, so explain to me how you how your footwork works, because like I said, nobody, I never saw anybody square up and just stand in front of their opponent the way that he did that. Yeah. Um, but he was so, I don't even say reactive, but he was aggressively reactive. If you step towards him, he was already mo moving towards what openings that you were presenting and he was really good at spotting them and good at landing them so um yeah that would make sense and as i understand it it wasn't um uh david Fonsworth worth up from uh, also up from eldemir back in the yeah, he, day he, he kind of did that a little bit but not he had a similar style and, and what os explained to me was because he worked he, I guess he had some sort of a like a forester job professionally. So he would work with his arms over his head, cutting things all day long. So his shoulders were built to have his arms up. So he had a very high Florentine style. Um, that's another term we have on our list, by the way, Florentine used for to describe two sword. Yeah. Um, but and there's some de debate over what the origin of the word Florentine is. I don't know if we need to get into into that etymology of the word, but um, but I guess it was unusual because David's, his shoulders were just conditioned for, to have power from this really high, high guard type position. Um, and he could deliver a lot of power for, with it. Um, anyway, so, uh, looks like we have some questions about, uh, shields and equipment. Maybe we could transition to that. 
Okay. Um, obviously, the one everybody's probably heard is heater shield. The way that this was explained to me is that it was like a heater, and, and a heater was like an old, uh, what we would consider an iron, like for ironing clothes. It was just a chunk of steel, and it had it was a little kind of triangle with kind of rounded edges on it. That's what was used to be called a heater. This is what was explained to me why that shape is called a heater shield. Um, I got to drop for one sec. You keep on. Okay. So maybe that the, the, the origin of that word and term was a little different, but that's what was explained to me. A um, couple other shield shapes that are, are rather unusual. Of course, I'm, I think everybody's heard of the, uh, <clears throat> the kite shield, usually the, like a Norman kite or some kind of long, skinny, usually pointed shield at the bottom, but it can be, it can be round at the top. Um, the bunny round, and that, that was one that Branis actually had when I first, when I first came across him, it was, it looked like a round shield on the bottom and then a heater shield on the top. So if you took a circle and then squared off the top of it, that is basically what, what a bunny round is. Um, or at least from, from my experience. Oh, you're muted, Branis. So they use a bunny round out west a lot, right? Okay. So mine was a relatively large bunny round at 26 inches, um, mm -hmm. but uh, which was our crown legal at the time. It, it mm -hmm. was the longest we could use. Uh, yeah. But every once in a while, you still see a bunny round. There's a little, mine wasn't quite a bunny round just because of the way the hand strapping was. The okay. shape was a bunny round, but the hand strapping was was not. Um, I, what I've seen in bunny rounds is, is they tend to, I think they tended to have more of a, almost long uh um hand or arm position but okay. um yeah you know if you really want to get some feel watch some of the older uh western videos or they use them quite a bit okay cool um and then a, a, a vonkel shield um uh, which you don't see many of the, them around they're they're pretty rare and it's essentially a, a an equilateral triangle and it can be either straight edged or usually the edges will bow just a little bit um, almost like it's a triangle that's a little fat and, um, they kind of, they come and go and, but they're, they're somewhat rare. Uh, but that's what a, a Vonkel shield is. Um, it's spelled they also had the triangle. I mean, they had the square shield, right? Right. Uh, yeah. The square and the rectangle that was huge. I know. And Nancy the rectangle still there. used a lot. The rectangle yeah. still used in Nancy or, uh, although starting to not see them quite as much, um, mm -hmm. still see them in, uh, uh, in, uh, or uh, uh, not anterior. Well, you, Trimeris you had, had rectangle. Yeah, Trimeris. Right? Anterior, anterior had some of the smaller ones. Um, mm -hmm. uh, His Majesty, uh, Majesty Steiner has. Uh, I don't think he's His Majesty. His Prince, Prince Steiner has it. Uh, uses one in Eldmere. Um, okay. So yeah. lots of lots of kingdoms use those. You'd think they make sense because there's a lot of surface area. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think that covers well, most of the heaters. Uh, most and, of the and, and some of the new ones. Did you, cover, did you cover rounds? Of course, every every round you can think of, all the way to a buckler. Yeah. Uh, which is now small. now this is this was something that when you know, back when I'd started in the first few years, this was before center grips came into play. Yes. The round shield was a they called it a strap round, mm -hmm. and it was you know strapped on your arm, whether it was dished or not, and dishing a shield at least at the time before uh, we started getting aluminum that was that was spun into, into that dish curve was very hard to get. Um, I remember somebody had, had up here had access, they built some giant press and they made a plywood dished round blanks and were selling them for a while. I actually had one of those, I really dug it. But um, yeah, typical round shields tend to, tend to be, uh, initially they were strapped way back in the day, but then I don't know what happened, but suddenly center grips came into, into fashion and they usually were, uh, they went, I think round shields came and then shortly afterwards they started turning into ovals. And then you get like the, um, like Alanon's got the peanut. He's got his sort of. Yeah, it used to have the Norm peanut. Yeah. Norman, Norman peanut shape. And then, but you see a lot of ovals and sometimes they're curved and sometimes they're flat. Um, they became very popular and I, I think weren't those, uh, super popular in the Roman, Roman times. They either had the, the square scutums, scutums yep. or they had the, the oval shields that were also. And those were all right. center gripped, but those center grips usually depending, but the, normally they were a flat. 
So okay. you don't really hold them like that, where we hold most of our center grips. Okay. Um, now, the, the one thing, too, about those center grips, I always love flipping them open because I, I yes. knew the vulnerability was your hand grip. You can't stop that thing from being pivoted in your in your yep. hand. But some people will do this. And if you if you have a center grip or a center, center grip oval round, you can actually put a loose strap that hangs over your forearm so that it can't be flipped completely open. Now, and then, of course, if somebody tries to flip it close or flip it closed or flip it open the other way, it runs into your forearm. So it kind of limits how far the, the shield can be pushed in your hand. Um, it's kind of a good idea for for those that want to play with it. So and, and you know, they, they used to have what they called the punch round, which is, is essentially a, a dish. There's an early one, the early design. Again, it was a little bit old castle where essentially you would punch the shield out and that was a strapped small round shield that was domed usually. I have okay. actually one in my basement that's probably almost 40 years old. So um, and and I still see one or two people using those. It's very active style. The good part about you know the other part about uh, the difference between a, a strap and a center grip is with a center grip you can actually get a, the you can move the distance of that shield could be pushed out. Right. Comparative to a lot of times how far you can push a, a heater or right. a, a strapped. You know, there's one, one comment I have to jump in with here just because uh, I, the shield to me is probably one of the uh, one of the most dangerous weapons that there's ever been on a medieval battlefield. And yeah. because of SCA rules, we just have to use it like a defensive tool. But yeah. If you think about really fighting in armor. If I had to face somebody, you know, and fight for real, I would feed him that shield. And that shield would be a major part of the, the really the sword would be the finisher. Once I knocked them silly and hopefully onto the ground, it's the sword that would, would be the finishing part. But boy, the impact of that shield pounding on somebody is a huge part of, of I think, medieval combat, real medieval combat. Well, we see that in steel fighting, right? They use yeah, that quite absolutely. a bit. Um, the, yep. the, I think that some of that piece though, is if, if you look at, you know, it depends on if you're in tournament or not in tournament and things like that. Mm -hmm. So on horseback, trying to do that could essentially, uh, you know, you, you, because you have the reins on the horse and stuff, it gets much yep. more difficult because usually oh, yeah. it goes with your, your shield hand. So you Absolutely. have your sword hand open, uh, on ground combat, usually you want to use a bigger shield. So there's not as much punching that you can do with the edge of the shield because you'd right. have to use the whole front which is more mm -hmm. of a push than a punch. Right. Um, but you're hundred percent right. A, a shield, you know, weighs anywhere. You know, I had a 16 pound shield for a while, mm -hmm. um, uh, compared to a couple pound sword. Right. So right. You know, there's a lot more, more momentum. Uh, mm -hmm. and I have to say, uh, you know, the, in, in a way, I'm kind of glad we don't get hit in the head. Yes. punched in the head with shields oh yeah absolutely the, the the rules are there for a reason and i yeah. and i i definitely endorse them but just to appreciate i think the shield doesn't get enough respect as as a, a, a potent weapon um but and best pointed out yeah the battle of the nations and the live steel stuff they punch yeah. with the shield all, all the time, time. yep um, so you know she also she has another one here and and uh, uh you know how small does a round shield have to be to be a buckler right mm -hmm. um so, and, and really a buckler isn't necessarily defined by a center grip or a strap. Cause I've seen little hand bucklers, which are all strapped. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think uh, each kingdom might challenge what size that a buckler is considered. I, I've seen new bucklers being sold uh, that are much bigger than our old standard bucklers that we used to get years ago uh, that are, you know, probably two, three inches bigger, which makes a lot of, on a round that makes it significantly larger. Um, but I, there's no rules. So uh, I, I don't think we can really say what makes a buckler. Well, and and I think from a, from a rule standpoint, I, as I recall, there was, there was a the differentiation between like a tiny hand buckler, you could still grab another weapon with it. Whereas a shield, technically you couldn't hold a shield and a, and a weapon in that hand, but you know, that that's at least under SCA rules, that's a differentiation. Um, all right. So, and, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting on that one because, you know, let, let's talk about Madu then, right? All right. 
Yep. So, um, you know, I think I think some of that is somewhere, all about... somewhere Donegal's brain is probably exploding right now. Not <laughs> <laughs> the mention of the word. <laughs> so uh, it, it's interesting because I know in Penzik, uh, you know, a lot of people used to carry um, a heater on their back, slung mm-hmm. on their back, and right. you'd be spearing with that, and mm-hmm. and you'd flick it. Somebody would throw a shot, and you just cover that shield would cover your top side shoulder and stuff, and then you'd bring it back, right. and you could start spearing again. And mm-hmm. those are the ones they essentially were like, no, you can't do that. That's you're right. blocking with something that's you're not actively controlling. So they yeah, made an act of control rule. So mm-hmm. now I think that's the way the Madu gets away with it because you're you know actively controlling the small shield. You just have weapons on either end. Right. Um, and since the SCA doesn't allow or, ha- shot blows to the hand are not counted. Even if you were fighting just with a, a spear in one hand and you got hit on your hand, you didn't need to have a buckler shield for you, for you to not have to take, you know, give up your arm for that. Right. And so, and, you know, then it's down to a, a rule question of, okay, what's the difference between fighting with a, a spear in one hand? Really, you can slide your hand up and down the, 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 the shaft of the weapon but you can still attack with either thrusting tip if the spear has a thrusting tip on each side. And I know for the longest time, the rules were that a spear could only have a thrusting tip on one end, but then butt spikes came into play. And now they had pull arms and spears with thrusting tips on either side. Um, so, uh, so yeah, <clears throat> that's kind of the, the whole Madu spear thing. Yeah, even pole axe, same, same gig, right? So pole right. arms, all that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I know Best must have learned this from somebody else because it goes way too far back because I haven't seen one for for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And that is a, a slider for a spear. Yep. Well, they were outlawed for pretty quickly or at some point there, and yeah, they disappeared. Interestingly enough, there's a Japanese, a traditional Japanese sword uh, spear rue that uses sliders. So, so let's explain what a slider is. is. What's that? explain what a slider is so everybody okay knows. so a slider would be like a, a a collar that you would have on the shaft of the spear that you would grab the collar and you would slide the the um the spear shaft through it instead of grabbing it with your hand so it would just allow you to slide um slide very quickly now i'm not sure exactly why they were made illegal in the sca i don't know if there was some incident or set of incidents that that caused them to be outlawed that's a great Um, question but i do know that one of the things they're useful for and i I actually would do this the gloves of my gauntlets i liked it when the leather got kind of aged and smooth because i could loosen the grip and i could actually slide very easily the the shaft of the of the uh the spear through my gauntlet and the way the japanese would use them because they had you know really long spears they would they would engage at spear tip range. And then when they got rushed, they'd take the backhand and they'd throw the back of the spear through the slider. And it would, it would retract the point as fast, if not faster than the person rushing in. So they basically got a second chance to try to thrust them as opposed to having to go to a backup weapon or to, you know, wind up in a, one of those crazy, you know, uh, spear fights in a phone booth yeah, um, type of thing, which are always hilarious. <laughs> so um you know why we're on weapons a little bit you know we can we can talk uh you know obviously we talk a little bit about modus everybody should understand their weapons from their kingdom but maybe maybe some weapons you haven't seen in the um, in the past you know like a modu there's a lot of kingdoms that just don't have them or don't have people mm-hmm. using them much um and maybe know, we should describe modu in case somebody has not run across one yeah and both um, types really i mean yeah you know so they're um, now, as I understand, what I've seen for, of real Madus, they tend to look like, imagine a basket hilt or some kind of hand protection or buckler with generally two spikes coming out of either side. Uh, some of the some of the ones like the African ones were, I believe, like antelope horn. Yeah, that's um, what it were. Yep. And they, they so it's like two thrusting weapons sticking out of uh, out of some kind of a protective center grip handle and um i think i originally saw the first sca one back about 25 years ago 30 years ago and uh they kind of came in and were a bit of a novelty 
Um, I know there was a, a lot of d debate and dispute over, well, would it, was this a, actually a battlefield weapon or was this, what the hell was it? Um, granted, the SCAs tends to be pretty loosey-goosey with what it allows generally, so nobody really made much of a stink about it. Um, but I've seen them, at least SCA versions, that have had hooks put on the top so you can reach out and hook things with it. Um, of course, I've seen the same thing with axes, like Danish yeah. axes used in one hand, and they can, the wielder can hook with the Danish axe and then have, you know, a mace or a sword in the other hand and kind of use it as a second weapon that way. Well, um, and, and to go back to Madu real quick, there's a lot of different ways the Madu kind of shows up. And it's yeah. it, not every one of them is a Madu, but I think what we do is we kind of classify Madu as the use of a long weapon in one hand with two points on the ends. So we have right. Madus that are essentially... Um, the period piece where it's essentially shield and shield and two points, one on mm -hmm. either end. Uh, right. A lot of people use a basket hilt with on a on a piece of rattan with two a point on either end. Right. Um, then you can go to a, a Danish axe mm -hmm. where your hand is essentially. Some of them have the bill of the axe covers the hand. Right. Um, like a bardiche. Yeah, exactly. And and then there's points on either end. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can just have the open spear with a point on each end and your gauntleted hand, right? Yep. Because then that that can... was one of my favorites, actually. That was fun. Yeah, yeah because you can slide that a little bit more. You can choke yes. it. You can make the bottom really long on uh, on mm -hmm. your on your quick flick out thrust, you yep. know, uh, or you can sit in the middle a little bit or a little bit down for closer mm -hmm. work for punches to the face. So you got a little bit more change in in distance, depending on which one you want to use more. Yep. And it provides a, a really good defense. If you if you move around it more than just pu pull it back and forth across your body, it's, uh, it, it does provide a good defensive shell. But I mean, it's basically like an A-frame with, with head to toe. I mean, I've used a six foot uh, spear, but I've seen even, even four foot spears provide a lot of coverage from, you know, top of the head to below the yeah. knee. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very fun style, very active though, um, which I, is kind of one of the things I liked about it. Well, and it's yeah. interesting because there's a gentleman out west that actually uses what he calls a, a broken, and I've seen actually more than that person, but he's probably the most famous one out there, uh, a broken lance. And there's no thrusting tip on either end. He's just using it as a blocking stick. Oh, okay. And nice. I've seen a couple other people use it as blocking sticks as well. And the reason they do that is because some people kind of lose sight behind the shield mm. and they prefer yep. to essentially keep their sight open and, and work around the stick. Yep, absolutely. And it is, it is a, just a plain old stick is, is a great tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. All right. Well, let's get to, uh, let's do a few of the tourney formats and then let's get into, uh, we've got footwork and then um, melee terms. Uh, so, so a few of the the the, um, the tournament formats. Of course, everybody knows about double elim tournaments, double elimination, single elimination. Uh, there were some interesting ones that that got popular uh, a few decades ago, and then it kind of comes in waves where you know people really like doing elim tourneys. And then uh, so one of the one of the ones that that I noticed became popular a few decades ago, kind of as a counter to the typical double elim tourney where people would. You know, they go to attorney and if, if it's double limb, you get, if you lose two fights, you're done. That's it. Like you, you did your whole day. So one of the things that got popular was they called it a pool tourney or a round robin. So with that tournament format, you'd show up, you'd be put in a pool. It's kind of like um, uh, the NFL. So you, you're in a conference and every team plays every, every other one. So you get in, let's say a pool of six people you fight every one of the six people and then the, the, the top two record, you know, the people at the top two or top three records go on and then they go into a, a tree a tournament, like a, a single or double elimination tournament from there. So it basically guarantees that if you're not, not really highly skilled fighter that goes on through to late in the tournament, you still get six competitive fights at, like at worst or five or six. Um, and there have been kind of some modifications of how that that can work, but that's the the basic thrust of the pool tourney. Um, then there was the warlord tourney, which was, and I remember we this is where we started uh, Warlords and Warriors Day event back was like 26 years ago now, where 
you started off with a one-on-one -on -one fight and if you if you won that fight the person that you you fought joins your team and the next round is two on two and you you're the commander of that team and if you beat that two they join you and now you're commanding a four person team and you keep the the teams keep getting larger until you until you get to the end where you're two it's a melee where with everybody in the tournament is on one side or the other led by the person who won or led the winning team all the way through um and that that was that was quite successful people really liked that one uh, it's kind of the the best of getting a feel of single combat tournament all the way up to to melee all in one all in one tournament tournament format um <clears throat> i see you got swiss five here that's the next one you know i had heard of, of swiss five and it's one that was not popular in the mid realm or in north shield or from what i could tell most of the places that i traveled uh, and with with and i so i'm not firm on the definition of it and if anybody anybody is listening that can give us a firm definition of what a swiss five is please let me know the closest that i think i got to it was actually in the in the uh tournament format of the cornet that i won and that was uh Galen Smiling was uh, my predecessor. He had this format where you show up, all of the combatants were listed on cards and there was like a random draw of these cards that, that wound up pairing. So there was no tree, it was randomly drawn every round. So you weren't sure who you were gonna get based on this card draw oh, thing. Interesting. Um, and it was a little strange. I don't know what the advantage was of, of not having a tree versus a random card draw. Well, um, I mean, you could get thrown against a person you know you can win all the time, right? You get you get that lucky. Well, if, lucky, I mean, if lucky tree, like if you add a lot of draw, random. drawn randomly, the first round would be random, and then you could look at the tree theoretically to see who you might be facing as you go up. Of course, as a competitor, we know that's you don't you don't even bother doing that. You're right. you should be focusing on one fight at a time, and and it didn't. I didn't really make much difference, but, uh, and maybe there's something I was missing in the details of how that ran, or maybe that was not even a Swiss five, but, um, that's kind of what, what that was. So let's add a couple that haven't been out there for very long and you don't see often. And, uh, that's a, a single limb. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Uh, yep, you, yeah. Which is the play, the NFL playoffs. You lose, you go home. You're done. You lose, you go home. A double O limb, which is what we used to do all the time. So mm -hmm. you would often travel to events and you would fight possibly two people and be done for most of the day because sure. a major tournament could have lasted four or five hours, mm -hmm. depending on how many people are in it. The other right. one is counted blows. And so so a single O limb is one and done, you're you're done. A double mm -hmm. O limb allows you to have pools. So the the idea is if you you know if you did, you know, defeated, you go into the one loss pool and you fight everybody else with one loss while the ones with no losses keep moving up. Right. And that pool essentially gets smaller and smaller. These people have to fight twice as much in the losing pool to get up to the top. And then usually at the top, they fight off uh, a best two out of three, at least in the mid-round crown tournament, they fight off. The loser has to win twice. The winner has to win just once uh, mm -hmm. to move on to the to the essentially finals. Um, right. So that's how a, a double, uh, a limb works. A counted blows tourney, you essentially count the blows. You don't take blows. You essentially would challenge somebody to five good blows. Those five could be anywhere. And uh, and that's how that tourney would go. Um, very medieval. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people like them. You don't have to go on your knees. You don't have to go lose arms. You just count how many times that person bested you. Right. So, uh, but another one, as they talk about, is Atlantean speed tourney. What's that? Okay, yeah, these were fun, and and I where I ran into this was out at Penzik, and I think they had yep. it with a Squires tourney, if I remember right. But yeah, you can do them with any any group of people, and you basically line everybody up, and you just have them pair off. You know, just match the line. You go out and you do your fight. You come back, and they separated. At least the one that I saw, they separated them into who who lost who won so there's your your winner's pool and their your one loss pool they'd line them up again and just you you 
match the lines, find your opponent, go out and do your uh, do your fight. If you lost a second time, you're out. Other, if you lose your first time, then you go back, like just so you're describing, you go into the one loss pool. If you won, you go into that, and then they just match the lines up and they just keep going. Like it's a very fast way to run the tourney that doesn't stress out the list table, <laughs> having to yeah. organize who's who and, and whatnot. So did you did you call out a bear pit? That's I had my fingers crossed to remember the the bear pit to me was when when I remember the bear pits becoming popular was almost a backlash from uh, yeah. double this, limbs the double limbs and how popular they were where people just I just want to show up and fight and so the bear pit was basically the old school king of the hill you go out so one, one one person starts on the field challenger comes out whoever wins gets to stay on the field and you keep going through people. If you keep winning, you keep fighting. If you lose, you go to the back of the line and you can, you know, cycle through to try to win your fight so that you stay out on the field and fight until you either are, are bested or you can actually just say, all right, I'm exhausted. Next one comes up. Uh, yep. Again, it's very easy to administer. Uh, and usually the victor, they just tally up who has the most victories in in the bear pit and they just log it like numbers and they, they report the winner as being whoever gets the most wins in that. So all of these tournaments, where are they fought in? The Eric, right? Yep, the Eric, yeah. <laughs> or, or the list. They often right. just call them the list. Um, but yeah, the Eric is a, is a term not widely used, but everybody should know what when they say the Eric, what, what that is. So, but I mean, they should, yeah. So when, when you hear the words of Eric, it's usually used mostly out West. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier reference to what essentially the list field is. Mm -hmm. um, in your, uh, a funny, funny little part, um, in your society marshal's handbook, you can also call not only the list or the Eric, you can call it the Ul Ulrich as well, because uh, mm, okay. uh, we happen to know the, uh, uh, there's a few people I happen to know the the, the marshal and he snuck it in for somebody. <laughs> it, it's not really a thing. Uh, we there it, while a pandemic was going, a fake petition went around and and uh, everybody was having fun with it. So, I think probably cool. the next piece we should probably jump into some melee terms, maybe. Yeah, let's go. Let's go for the melee thing. Um... Let's because they're probably best. the, Come on, the worst. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. She threw up a number of terms in there for uh So I'm going to go back up to the top and yep. we'll we'll grab Here's one. So she talks about uh and you're you're just freezing up a little bit Tristan. So she talked okay. about the pulse charge versus the charge. So and uh, there's the also a column charge. And there's also a column charge. That's mm -hmm. correct. Um so in my group, uh, and this changed in our kingdom a number of times, your kingdoms will define usually a standard set of orders so that uh, the whole kingdom can kind of keep it under one. Everybody understands what commanders are saying. Mm -hmm. Pulse charge back in the day was essentially you would pulse up to you. You would be fighting. You would have probably a bunch of spears on this side and a pulse would run up to them, take a couple shots and fall back. Mm -hmm. Okay, some other places I've seen a pulse, essentially, they'll stay there and they'll run up, but not hit the line, just run up far enough to essentially engage the spearmen. Mm -hmm. And they would take that position as well. So we, I've seen them both ways. My normal pulse is there and back. A charge, so a charge could essentially be a full out charge. You don't stop. In other words, and if I have a line... Right. If I have a line, the line isn't just doing this. The line is fighting to get through. And, mm -hmm. those, and you end up breaking apart and distances change. And your line also, as in, this is used a lot in medieval time, in the middle, in the middle ages, where like Normans used it. The Normans would come out with their cavalry, harass the front lines, engage, and then fall back. And they would charge because they think they're in full retreat. And then they would essentially, that charge would run into a organized line again which would destroy them mm -hmm. um so there's the danger in what what a real charge is right. um 
and then um, what was the other chart? Oh, column charge. Go ahead. Column that was it. Yeah. I love column charges. Yeah, I, I love them too. And um, basically, you get a, a narrow column, oftentimes only two fighters wide, but you stack them about six or eight ranks deep. And so you you bring them up behind your 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 line, and then you push them through like a concentrated point. And that yep. point may, may be a gap opening. It may be, um, you know, some opportunity. We we found that putting them right along a bridge was not not wise. But if you put them about two feet in from the edge of the bridge and you hit not exactly the end, but almost, then you can usually sort of bump the people that are standing at the edge of the bridge off the bridge and then penetrate through. And that usually opens up, creates a flank opportunity, which actually brings us to the next term, which is... Um, I think she had flank versus deep flank. And this is a flank is a military term goes way back. Basically, it means engaging a unit from their side. The side is their flank. And you can even think of this in terms of one on one combat. If you if you step out to the side, you are attacking to, to the flank. Um, so deep flank means you're going deep behind the end of end of a line. Um, usually around to behind a unit, which, you know, because of engagement rules, it's, it's advantage. You're always going to be an advantage being behind your opponent, but there's limits of what you can do back there. You can't just go up and hit them. So if let's you, add another one to that because we have something called a wheel. And essentially what happens is you want to hit their flank. So normally right. when you hit a flank, you're essentially turning sideways and going into mm -hmm. the flank. A wheel, sometimes you can overlay a unit and then the, it leverages off as a wheel Kind of circles in right. to create hits the side of the unit. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so that's another one. Uh, she uh, the horns of the bull. Mm -hmm. So so you got it. You got an explanation for that one. It's been a while since I've seen that tried or done. Uh, it seemed to be popular. I remember a couple decades ago of where you'd take your your ends and you'd base to try to get to the flank you'd bring you bring ends of your line out on either end and bring them forward so that you your your line kind of turned into this kind of arc where it's like horns they form these two two horns going out from either side uh that was in an era where we kind of went past the just let's have two shield walls collide with each other and hey attacking these flanks is pretty pretty effective so how do we how do we do that? It was kind of an initial um, exploration into how do you get aggressively get on on an opponent's flank and attack it and get them to perhaps fall back and fold in. And because if it if you have this line where if this is your horn well, there we go if this is your horns of the bull and you get you get the opponent to kind of fall back, you start encircling them. And when right. you start encircling and closing in, then they get all bunched up and can't fight effectively. That's that's how I see the uh, the horns of the bull thing, and going. and that's some ways the horns of the bull are used. It can essentially be used to create a pocket effect. Um, right. I've seen the horns of the bulls being used to create to uh, to soft just leave the middle essentially put your the, the largest majorities of your fight on the outsides and leave mm -hmm. the middle essentially barely uh, attended so that um, you know you have more men on the outside uh, against your opponent than the inside. You know, and usually essentially owning the outside of an opponent is relatively dangerous for your opponent. Um, right. That's why oftentimes they'll pin themselves against uh, mountains for large armies or uh, walls or, or, or even a gate where you essentially can't get to the sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where, you know, we get into a gate. Uh, that's where we get the kill pocket from. Right. Right. And so I'm sure so anybody that's, that's seen a bridge battle has seen this happen where you've got your, your shield line that goes from one edge of the bridge to the other, and it's a straight line, and you get pushed back, or maybe you draw your opponent into you by falling back, and then as you run out of bridge and you you open it up, the line curves and you get this big semicircle that the 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 opponent that's pushing across the bridge is limited in their front, and they come out from the edge, and now they've got like 180 degrees worth of opponents facing them from all the way around. Um, right. And the hard I'm, part I'm, on that is as, as you push out and create that bowl effect, what you're essentially doing is individually you're you're exposing your sides 
to attack. Right. Yep. And and that's that's why. And you have you know, fewer it, people because that yeah. kill pocket's already got a lot of people in it. You have yeah. fewer people to spread out and on, on, on that frontage, so you, you're at a disadvantage um, when you push into a kill pocket. Yes. Um, so and like with military um, doctrine, they they refer to that as like an ambush, and the way out is to punch your way through it. Punch you your way through. It. That's there. correct. You have um, to column charge those scenarios. Yes. And yes. most of the times into the corners, unless you find something weaker. So. Right. Right. Um, um, you know, as we were talking about essentially flanks. Uh, here's one you'll hear, and this is specifically ours, pretty sure. Uh, the tidy bowl of death. Right. Oh yeah, the old term of the tidy <laughs> bowl of death. Yep. Yep. And that's so, that describes that swirl when both sides are going for a flank, and they kind of wind up circling each other. You know, tr trying to get the same flank, and it's generally you you try to attack into the what would be the your right side, push your right side forward because most people are right-handers with shields it's easier to push your your shield to that shield side than go the opposite way but um yeah the tidal bolt tends tends to want to go this way. i wonder down in australia if it goes the other it goes way. the other way yeah there you, are. <laughs> uh, you know and, and and since we were talking kill pockets um uh, and and this is what you'll see in kind of the horns of the bull type of scenario is a what they're doing in the center is sometimes a soft deny or sometimes tidy bowl of bed, death you have to deny one side so what refuse. is a deny yep. mm -hmm. yeah we've right. always called that a, a ref, to refuse yep the refuse, refuse or deny <laughs> yep. go ahead and let them you know how is that executed yeah it's it's essentially what they call also call skirmishing which is when you go up to harass a line you're not fully engaging them but you're threatening them enough that they have to take you seriously. And so as they start to, to engage and come into you, you, you don't, I hate calling this a retreat because there's a route, which is when you turn tail and run, right. But you, you harass them as you give ground. So you, you, you halt their ability or you impede their ability to, to advance on you because you're harassing them, but you're doing it you, you need to play it safe. You're not engaging them so much that there's a good chance your side's going to get killed. And usually skirmishers are used to engaging a, more troops than they have themselves. That's correct. They're just, they're just there to harass and, and be like, like angry hornets. They're, they're not going to kill any, kill the, the other side, but they're yeah. going to make them so you can't, they can't ignore you. The, the idea is they slow that unit down enough. Right that your backside that's attacking hard can re reach all the way around the field. Right. And, so, and the theory is that like, let's say we, we, we each have a side of 50 fighters and I've got 10 skirmishers. Those 10 skirmishers should tie up 20 people. So that means the 40 that are remaining, our core is now only having to face 30. So when they have that advantage, they, on that side, they should be taking, taking full advantage of that, of that overmatch. Um, right that's the basic theory there and there are organized and i actually seen these in the sca uh, the east does these actually relatively well and that is a they use it in their retreats in other words and and the, what a retreat is and we see this in the ukraine right now quite a bit um mm -hmm. a retreat you you essentially put a holding unit in place which are essentially what would be you know the uh, the holders are there to deny the enemy from coming in and hitting the back end of a retreat Mm -hmm. So right. that's that's that same organized retreat type of deal. Absolutely. Uh, in this case, they're not retreating. The, the it's just the other side of the line is attacking in a you know when when we talk a deny, but in a retreat, you you actually put people in a deny up front and and cover covered path back. Yep. Uh, the yep. East actually does that. It's actually hard in the SCA to get people to do that, but when you see sometimes your line crumbling and you just know it's not going to be there. There's nothing wrong with telling your front lines like, hey, guys, stay here. And then you evacuate the back end of your line. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, and, it's not uh, either, any military experienced military will tell you it is the hardest thing to do a controlled retreat without letting it become a route. Right. Like it, even disciplined troops have it. Have, have it. That's a challenging. Well, I mean, challenging we saw route. that in Ukraine as well. Right. The route was when Ukraine took most of property, most of its property back when they broke the, the Russian line and swept behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and that caused a full out route. 
Uh, now you notice then when the Russians are in a bad place or the Ukrainians are in a bad place, they fortify that position a little bit so that whoever the, the small unit holding it essentially doesn't allow a route to occur. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, cool. I know we've got uh, about eight minutes left. Did we want to shift gears and try to cover some of the steps, uh, the footwork? So, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely could. And footwork, you know, it, it's funny because I, I was like, oh, I'm going to pull up all my footwork. And then I looked, I'm like, oh, man, these are names from, you know, some of them are boxing, some are fencing, some are, you know, like, let's let's talk about simple steps. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking about the lunge step. Right. Yep. And this is this was a term that 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 I like to use a lot with just trying to get people to understand that that there are different steps and to, to differentiate them. And the lunge step is you imagine like a, seeing a fencer and he is, if he wants to go forward, his front foot steps out and then his back foot will come along to, to be in his new stance forward. So you start with a lunge, uh, but as opposed to starting with your back foot, like you're normally walking, if you want to take a step and your right foot's forward, your left foot comes from behind and then it, it you alternate going back and forth. Um, you, this I've seen this also called a shuffle step, but that ten, the shuffle tends to bring in different imagery of, of it being short, uh, very short, kind of a stutter step. But it's when you, if, and you can do the lunge step side to side too. It doesn't have to be back and forth. If you want to go to the left, you step out to the left and then your right foot trails and, and comes to the new position. And see, this um, is where kind of, you know, for, for me, the lunge step is essentially sometimes you can lunge and just bring it back. Right. So you like we lunge step in fencing all the time and we lunge yeah. step. Then in, it's a real honest to God lunge. You right. Lunge in spearing. In um, the pendulum step, which you're talking about now, is essentially one foot goes, the other shuffles right back to its place. Or mm -hmm. what we call the gather what we call the gathering step. In other words, um, right. you 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 uh, you essentially can do a drop step and a gathering step. Mm -hmm. Right. So your feet never come together like a right. shuffle does. Your mm -hmm. feet actually you know, one stretches and the other gathers yep. and it, that can happen at the exact same time. If you, if you have good flow, right. right? And that and can happen in any direction forward or backwards. Right. Now the, 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 what I was taught was the pendulum step is if this is your feet, let's see if I can do this. If this is your feet and normally you would say you'd step out with one and then you'd bring your foot yep. in the, the pendulum is your feet step together and then you step out. So, it, so it, what, the, the, the video, the video I was playing for boxing doesn't have that as the pendulum stuff. Okay. What for, for boxing? Know. Okay. Yeah. Let's, um, see what that is. let's see here. Let's uh, add this to the stream. Mm -hmm. So you see how he's, he, he essentially steps and slides. So okay. that's like yeah. what, what I call the gathering step. Now you see how it, that kind of the bouncing step that they use right. for. And, and to me, like called. that's because the there there isn't it's like a hop it's it doesn't seem yeah. like a feel like a step where you have at some point at one point your feet get farther apart and then they restore their their normal distance um but so for me a shuffle step and i it literally what i call a shuffle step is where your feet come together and okay. then spread out to its position right and that's what was taught to me as a pendulum step right so it's just yeah you could call it a shuffle terminology step. yeah exactly yeah. And um, so when you use a shuffle step, you will find like a pendulum step or what I call a gathering step because your back mm -hmm. foot gathers to the front or the front foot gathers to your back. Mm -hmm. That's a short step mm -hmm. relatively. Sure. Where a shuffle step gives you a little bit of momentum and a, a, a little bit more shift. You will find that in a shuffle step, you get more distance. But mm -hmm. if somebody hits you in a shuffle step, your feet are together. It's a weak position. Right the and then a crossing step right is where mm -hmm. essentially you cross over your other foot could be front right. or back mm -hmm. in a crossing step is actually your longest step because you're actually passing it and then falling all of your center carries you all the way past so that's your longest step you can sure. do those I, I talk about doing those in a circle mm -hmm. i talk about you know lomochenko does those a bit in a circle mm -hmm. uh, you can do shuffle steps in a circle you can do shuffle steps straight forward uh, you can do, you know, the, the the long passing step. There's another step, right? So mm -hmm. passing step is where you're leaning and you're, the back foot gets to a point that it cannot stay in its position anymore and it passes your front foot, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Yep. So, so that's your passing step. Um, we'll do that when we're doing these 
big fall, you're leaning with your center, you're pushing your center. And then just as you're losing it, you snap a blow and the passing step occurs. And then you fall mm -hmm. back into position. Sure. And the reason we do that is feet, visually feet, people can see feet much faster than something coming perceptionally straight at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, the big one is the drop step. And this yep. this was something that that Jack Dempsey described in his championship boxing book, which is, I think, a fabulous book on body mechanics and delivering power. And it it definitely relates to to SCA combat. And I did a video on on the drop step and how to get familiar with it. The the one thing is it's not instinctual at all, and it's nothing like the how we normally walk around during the day, so our body doesn't get used to it. But if you stand normally and rather than because let's see if I can illustrate this, but if you think of standing normally and you your body wants to walk and it wants to step forward with the left foot, your body used used to usually shifts its weight onto the right foot to support it. It lifts the left foot to step and then it falls in that direction. And that's slow. Works well for for getting us to the grocery store. But in terms of fighting and boxing, in order to, to step forward with, with the, the foot, you just lift that foot and your body falls that way. So you're using, and I think uh, Dempsey also called it the falling step, if I remember right. It's been a while since. Yeah, I've and in fact, in fact, almost every step you can, once you get used to it, the, the trick with a drop step is anytime that your balance is farther than your, your foot is and mm -hmm. you fall into it. And, and right. in that fall, you move the foot that's in front to pick up that fall and you gather mm -hmm. that back foot. Right. And, and unlike um, and, going to walk where you shift your weight onto a support leg to hold yourself up, you are letting yourself fall forward. And, and Dempsey would use that to generate power. Now his body is falling forward and he would have a blow behind it that would have the weight of his body coming forward. Correct. So he wasn't using his chest or his shoulders to punch, which any any boxer will tell you, do not you're not you're not, not going to hit with real power. You need to get your body into it. Uh, actually doing that. And what I found integrating it with my SCA fighting was if I wanted to move my head and dodge and slip, the, the drop step was the fastest way to, yeah. to move the head and to, and to do another, another term that we're, that uh, we use quite a bit on the show is level change. Not it, don't keep your head at the same level. You want to drop it down because when you, you move it and drop it, it's much harder to hit. So you really integrate part uh, level change with drop steps and they can be, you know, I like uh, going at oblique angles with them. We can go straight forward and go side to side. So what's the, an oblique angle? Oblique is when you move basically to the side. It's a right. one word term to meaning going to, to the side. Um, for example, your abdomen, your obliques are the, the, the muscles on either side of your torso. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and so there's a lot more, you know, ideas there, uh, you know, and, and I guess we could cover a ton of them. Um, the true boxers, uh, the, the way he was would do it, you'd also have a bit of a level change at the end of, of a true drop step. And they, usually mm -hmm. that drop step is you're dropping hard into the ground and delivering mm -hmm. a blow. Yeah. Um, it can and boxers also would use the term uh, yeah. sitting into the punch. So you want to punch. deliver power, sit into that punch, and that's okay. that indicates that falling. And that absolutely works in the SEA and, and how to mm -hmm. get more power from, from blows. So uh, but it also that drop step is very useful in the SEA to minimize what looks like your feet moving. So if I step to move, that's an opportunity, even if I don't not doing a shuffle step, but a simple pendulum step or you know, stepping out and then bring a gathering step. Mm -hmm. When you're wide, you're also in a poor defensive position sometimes. Yeah. So, and with the know, additional weight of our armor, spreading our legs out to take a, a long step, yes, it's, it's more energy. It wears the, the muscles down quicker. Um, yeah. You can also slip. You hit some dry grass or or something. You know, if you step out too deep, can be precarious. And that's something boxers, because they're only wearing shorts, they don't have to worry about armor. Right. So you know, much less having the, the, uh, their center of gravity change depending on, you know, what they're wearing and stuff like that. So, yeah. so I'm going to, before we're, cause we're almost at the, we're pretty much at the end. I'm going to throw up a couple of words and we're not going to define them only because they're very difficult to define. Um, flow, mm. the zone, 
which could be one and the same. Mindlessness could be one of the same. We talk about all those things, right? Um, we, we talk about uh, center. Um, you know, for, for me, center is essentially where your, your balance and your, your center is the balance of your body. If you were to lay on a, a fence pole, you can fundamentally get center on one line. To get center on all lines, you'd have to be hanging there from one rope. Right. That rope will tell you where you, you're. You could is. consider it from physics to be your center of gravity. Yep. yep. Yeah, and that center can change depending on how things, you know, what's happening. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so there's there's those those uh, ideas. There's uh, you know a lot of the other mental ideas of inner body type of you know. Cl everything from being able to have that no mind to to those we have shows that talked a lot about no mind and flow um uh, and they were really initiative. good uh, yeah initiative and actually somebody brought that up uh because i don't want to because somebody has like well, you know what is essentially control the fight because we say that mm -hmm. and some of that is initiative some of that is putting enough pressure on your opponent. You don't have to throw blows. This is the bad habit. People think pressure is throwing blows. It's not. Putting enough pressure on your opponent to make them uncomfortable and control what they do. Mm -hmm. They're going to fight back. So even if I'm going backwards, sometimes I still have control because I'm pulling them. In boxing, that's what Muhammad Ali did. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea is controlling the fight is controlling what your opponent is doing. And if you right. control that, then you have opportunity to figure out their timing and be able to essentially do something. About it. Well, and I, and I think it gets in, intimidating the idea of like, well, how would I control somebody else's movements when in to some degree you're not, but you're influencing them. You're making them respond to what you're doing. That's correct. When they're, and that's the initiative part. If they're having to respond to you, you are in control of that fight until they somehow change it around and you have to respond to them and that may not be movement right right that is, it's mentally if you're literally look like you're the one controlling the fight and you're the danger and they're thinking in their head oh my god i'm in danger well there you're controlling the fight right right yeah. as mm -hmm. soon as you're like oh my god i have to defend this you're no longer controlling the fight mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it is there's a lot of it, that's relatively hard to understand. And it's and it is practicable. Um, I had to do it, this with Saib. She was like, I have no clue what that means. And I could see where she's coming from because it's mm -hmm. not clearly understood. And what I did is I showed her how I moved her. I was just doing flowing drills with her, like, you know, essentially pressure. And we do a, like a one minute drill and I constantly put pressure and move her around. And she was constantly reacting to me. And I'm like, now you're going to push me around. And I was like, I am not going to push back at all. And as she was, she had to go to my sides and I would respond. And that way she got a chance to see how to be on the front end of having initiative. Cause right. sometimes when you're new, you never have that chance. Mm -hmm. So you don't understand controlling somebody. You know, it's kind of funny. One of the ways you can practice it and you have to do this very gently because it can be really annoying, but you can play with a little bit is when you see somebody take a breath to speak, say oh, something. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is like practicing seeing them about to execute and you jump in and you ask a question or you say something and you intercept their statement. Mm -hmm. But the feel is the same. And watching and reading what they're, what they're doing. Because you can tell when somebody's sitting and is listening and when they, are start, they start to want to engage in a conversation, and if you even without interrupting, if you see that moment and you and you have a breath in you and you could you could speak, that's you taking initiative in a conversation. So so when you think about that, that's, again, more of a mental habit. But those mm -hmm. mental habits are really important in our game. Absolutely. So, yeah. well, we covered a lot of stuff and there's probably twice as much more still. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I hope uh, I know it was a relatively fast session and. Uh, you know, we're throwing a lot. We tried to group some things. We could probably have grouped it better. But, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the idea is we just wanted to throw those out, simple explanations. Uh, if there's any of these that you're like, okay, I want more understanding of it, let us know. Because, you know, if, if it's like, I want to know why, what the high guard is, we'll pull somebody that fights high guard out and have them come explain it. Mm -hmm. um, so 
if there's, if, you know, if we can find a uh, person at Fight High Guard or used to Fight High Guard. Um, but, you know, if, if there's something you really want to know, I don't want to have to pull everyone just because you're interested. I, but if you really like, I want to try that or, you know, I think that's what I do and I want to do it better. Let us know and we'll try to pull those people in. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is just a little bit of knowledge that Tristan, you really wanted to help people just not be confused by terms all the time. Right. Uh, or at least have the base. There's much more depth in every one of these terms. But uh, having having heard it and understand the base of it is the entry into knowing more. Yep. And it, it can be kind of uh, people can be shy about asking, thinking yep. that by asking the question, everybody knows, but they don't. And they feel you know like an idiot, but don't feel like an idiot. Every, there's times when none of us knew what any of this stuff was either. So uh, we're happy to share it and, and uh, get people kind of versed in, in the lingo because that's part of the community is to understand what everybody's talking about. Right. All right. Well, before we uh, say goodbye, I'm going to leave you all with one little fun one. Uh, here's, here's one that uh, gets used on our show a lot, uh, specifically by one person that it's almost becoming part of our language dialect in the SCA. I think I know and, what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> what is woo? <laughs> uh, and for everybody out there, uh, uh, Sir Bess, one of our coaches, uh, is awesome. Uh, but you know, sometimes you look at and and even in martial arts, they look and it's like she. That's pretty mm -hmm. much woo woo, right? You know, no. um, the you know, there's a there's sometimes you lay out something that may or may not be true, and it's hard to believe. And you're, it, it sounds like magic. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Feel free to follow up if you have comments or, or terms that you've heard that you like elaboration on, like Brana said. Um, not sure. what I know we've got something on the schedule tentatively. We, for next we week. have Ants de Aurora, uh, Heroes and Traditions, Part 1. So right. now a lot of those folks are uh, at Gulf Wars and stuff like that. But we're hoping to still try to get that episode in. Uh, uh, I'll be working with Alan on next week to make sure that either they're ready or not ready. And uh, hopefully we can we can have it. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks again for joining us, everybody. And have a good night and a great weekend. All right. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yep. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> good night.